been in venture now for 10 years and not knowing kind of whether I was going to like it or, or stay in it for a long time period, you know, fast forward to today, I find myself, you know, more energized about building a venture capital uh, firm with NEA, you know, than I could have been kind of building a product company today, and that's what's really exciting to our, me. Our whole time frame, it takes seven to 10 years now from initial company formation to successful exit, especially if your plans are to go public. Um, so patience, you know, I, patience is a weird word because there's so much that's happening at any one time with one of these companies that the world of startups is very action-packed. Um, so while you might be patiently kind of building to a successful exit, you always have that, um, that option of, you know, I wouldn't say you always have an option of exiting earlier because that's not the way these capital markets work, but you do have, you know, at certain points sometimes the option of building something bigger or kind of finding a different path. Uh, somewhere along the, the spectrum of a company's life that, that decision comes up. Um, and if the opportunity is there to build something bigger, we'll usually take that route because we want to, you know, build large, multi-billion dollar sustaining category leading companies. And we know that that will take longer, but we think that's the much more value accretive path to take. I think we've had uh, a successful run over the past year, you know, with MuleSoft and Elastic and Mongo and um, several healthcare companies just doing phenomenally well. Uh, so we continue to be really bullish. You know, we're not we're not trying to time markets. We're not good at that. Venture investors shouldn't be doing that. Um, you could argue no one can really time markets. So we're investing for the long term. And if we just consistently continue to do what we do, which is um, invest early, grow the companies, add value, create the structure of the board. Um, help them access the, uh, the, the markets to exit at some point. We really consider ourselves full life cycle investors and, and company builders. I think it's a little bit of the new normal, frankly. I don't think we're in a real bubble-ish time. I don't think, you know, valuations have certainly gone up. I don't think valuations are out of range. Um, most valuations are determined based on a very robust market <laughs> these days. A lot of people chasing, you know, a few deals. That's always the way it is. You know, the, the best companies have lots of suitors, but they have real financial underpinnings, I think, to some of these valuations. They're definitely overvalued in some cases, but um, when you look at how impactful a company can be over its lifetime and you're investing in something that could be a real category leader in a hundred, two hundred billion dollar market, uh, how much you pay for that series A you know, round is not going to you know, drastically affect your return on that company. You're, you're looking to be in the company. You want to be invested. So those can get competitive, but um, there's always a market clearing price. It's, it's not a it's not totally outrageous. Well, the funny thing is, is I do have, you know, several hardware companies, software companies that are all kind of driven by AI and more increasingly are in the industrial space. So manufacturing is 25% of our GDP. <laughs> it creates 25% of our GDP and really has not been changed since the industrial revolution <laughs> and that means it's missed the whole wave of internet it's missed networking it's missed cloud computing and now here we are um, on the heels of kind of a long discovery period of what artificial intelligence means and i think the implementation of that technology in particular and everything that drives artificial intelligence marries really well with kind of reinventing the industrial world um, and we've seen in periods of discovery and implementation of really big technologies like the internet or cloud computing that the implementation period is where really, really large companies, exits, value is created. Um, and so we're really excited about that in AI. Um, how that relates to some of these companies, you know, oddly enough, 
in the hardware world, you mentioned it can take a long time. It actually, you know, with the commoditization of hardware, with the distributed buying power inside these manufacturing companies or, you know, other customers, um, you can build and get to market in the hardware world almost as fast as you can in the software world. Um, so, you know, we invested in desktop metal in the fall of 2015. It was an idea that was nothing, you know, Rick and team had lightly started some technology development, but it was largely just an idea at that time period. Two years later, they were in market with a desktop version of a metal 3D printer that was um, 10 times cheaper than <laughs> what had been out there today. So it was the micro mini computer version of the supercomputer in, uh, in the 3D metal printing world. And um, that's, a, that's a very fast time to market. We're um, hosting a digital factory event where it's going to showcase a lot of startups, but it's actually to bring all those customers in from the industrial world uh, to really understand what, what they're buying, over what time period, how that distributed buying power has, has manifested or is manifesting, it's still happening inside some of these large companies and, and what they need. I think the other thing I do that's really insightful or has been really insightful is tour touring some of these factories, you know. <laughs> it's not something venture capitalists usually have on their calendars, but <laughs> it's um, it's hugely eye-opening when you go and you see, you know, you get so excited about a robotics company and then you go to the factory floor and you're like, yeah, that wouldn't be useful here at all. You know, kind of seeing the customers and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is, is very accessible, first of all, and it's very informative to, you know, understanding how real a technology can become uh, over what time period. The whole supply chain um, stands to be, you know, enabled in a different way. So not just the manufacturing, but the logistics, trucking. You know, we're investing in a company called Transfix that is um, kind of a marketplace for spot pricing and, and shipping. Um, and also can really reinvent how these large trucking contracts um, can be bid out. I think autonomous you know, driving, for instance, will have a huge impact on that market over time, um, but it's, it, that's a very long road. And uh, where we're investing more of our time and money, specifically around autonomous, is in some of the underlying technologies, sensing, LIDAR, radar, um, edge computing, uh, and, and that kind of feeds into how quickly autonomous driving can happen. You know, we looked around and said, <laughs> the kind of old adage of like, nothing changes unless you change it. So if we're not hiring enough women, even at the associate level, why is that? And uh, we started all the way back at the pipeline. Uh, we don't believe that there aren't women out there to be hired. It's just a matter of actively saying, okay, if we're hiring for this role, how many women have we interviewed? And when you do that, you realize you end up hiring women because you're seeing a diverse candidate pool. And I don't think we've, you know, you don't skew one way or the other. You just get a diverse candidate pool and you find the best person for the job. Um, is some, And sometimes that's a woman. And we hope that more and more it'll be um, people from various diverse backgrounds, um, but it's it, it's a very important conscious thing that you have to do. I'll also say that I think there is a tipping point when you have a diverse crowd. When you have, let's say, thirty percent of the decision makers around the table are from diverse backgrounds, whether they're female or male, or or otherwise. Um, it continues to reinforce itself. So if you have 30%, and I do think 30% is like the magic threshold mm -hmm. of people from diverse backgrounds, when you go to hire more people, you end up kind of being able to sustain that more easily, both because you've got people in those networks to bring more diverse candidates into the pipeline, right. but you also have the ability to attract candidates because they see a diverse pool on the other side of the, of the table. So they want to work in, in environments that are friendly to diversity. And if you see people that are more than just one person 
um, from a diverse background in a firm, uh, it, it's a sign that you know they've made that commitment and uh, to a diverse working environment.